Hi, welcome to Focus with Big Smith. My name is Levi Smith and today we'll be speaking with Ms. Magnan uh, Bowen Phillips, that's the wife of the Prime Minister. Um, on this program we'll get a, a little insight of who Mrs. Phillips is, who the wife of the Prime Minister is. So I'm not going to stand between you and getting to know who uh, Mrs. Phillips is. Mrs. Phillips, welcome to Focus, welcome to Big Smith News Watch. Thank you very much and greetings to all your viewers. All right, so let's jump right into this. Tell the viewers a bit about the wife of the Prime Minister of this country. Well, I grew up in Northeast of Penitence as a young girl. I'm the proud daughter of a tailor and cutter and a housewife. My father's name was George Leland Boeing. And my mother was Esme Glendora Bowen. As a young child, I grew up in a very stable environment. And so um, myself, along with my siblings, um, we enjoyed a very comfortable lifestyle. In terms of the wife of the um, Prime Minister, um, that's a very, very long story. But if I could start at the beginning, I would want to say that um, Growing up in the housing scheme area, I went to the East of Penitence Primary School and then I went off to the South Georgetown um, Secondary School. And from then, my first job was at the National Insurance Company um, as a clerk. I spent just a few months there and then I moved over to the Bank of Guyana where I worked for a number of years as Teller Tree. And with promotion, I went over to the exchange control department as an assistant principal, working with the late governor, Patrick E. Matthews. After my job at the Bank of Guyana, I went to work at the CARICOM Secretariat, and I stayed there for the last 32 years until I recently retired. All right. Um, so... You've virtually been someone not in the public or in the public's eye or in the spotlight too much. I would rather suspect that some of that might have changed when uh, Mr. Phillips became Chief of Staff of the Ghana Defense Force and uh, it evolved even further with him being um, the Prime Ministerial candidate for the People's Progressive Party Civic and ultimately now Prime Minister of the country. Um, what has the journey been like during those period? The transition, first of all, and then the journey. Well, as a young officer's wife, you know, my husband was a special forces officer. And so he was stationed most of the time outside of Georgetown at base camp Stevenson. So he was very, very busy and very committed officer. To me, um, service to country was very important for him. And so him being busy at work allowed me a lot of time to and a lot of space to grow as an individual. And so whilst working, I was able to do to study. So I've gotten my, I've gotten my um, bachelor's degree in public administration and my MBA also. During that course of time, I spent a lot of time um, doing a lot of evening classes so as a young girl and um, based on the influence of my mother my mother was someone who used to tell um, myself and my younger sister Jillian that it pays every young girl to get a job and so I always see myself as being able to go to work and earn a decent income so being the wife of an officer um, and him being away from home a lot, it allowed me to attend a lot of evening classes. So I did a lot of um, courses at the Carnegie School of Home Economics. And also I did some courses at the YWCA. And those were more or less a lot of cooking and homemaking courses. Um, with Singer, back in the day, they used to have a program for um, young women, sewing classes. And so I did all of those courses in dressmaking. 
But coming back to the whole issue of being a young officer and him being away from home, he will try to compensate whenever he's at home. So he will take over the cooking on, on weekends and holidays. So I was out of the kitchen um, on those days and I was very grateful for that help. But uh, as I said earlier, um, it allowed me to do a number of things. And so um, in terms of as a young girl, I did a lot of leadership development. I was part of an organization, the Junior Chamber International, and that's uh, JC's. You call it JC's, it's an organization for young people, and it really helps to mold you and, and, and developing you into being a young leader for the future. Uh, Mrs. Phillips, you spoke of advice to yourself and your sister Jillian which was given by your mom. And so not going too far away from that, that, um, from that statement, since we are already on that issue, what advice would you give to young girls um, out there um, being the wife of the prime minister? I would say to young girls they sh that they should always try to be themselves. Try always to be your own beacon of light. We're all different individuals. We do not, we are not on the same path. Stay in your lane, focus on yourself, develop yourself as an individual, and you never can tell along the road, along the road of life journey, you would meet somebody that is compatible with your dreams and aspiration, and you could become a perfect team. Tell us a bit, uh, Madam Phillips, about your stint at CARICOM, and outside of that, what are some of the other areas that you would have been involved in um, socially? Well, at the CARICOM Secretariat, I joined the CARICOM Secretariat in May of 1988 as a clerk. And over the years, I've been promoted. Um, and so when I retired a, f um, a few days ago as the project officer responsible for the documentation center and registry, I would have completed almost 32 years of service, regional service to the Caribbean community. It was quite an interesting journey at um, CARICOM. And I say that because it allowed me to um, not only work, but also to travel. It also allowed me a lot of training opportunities. And um, in terms of some of the social activities of, that I was involved in at CARICOM, I ran for the office of president of the staff association and I had quite a wonderful experience implementing the work program of the, the executive committee and we did a lot of social activities so CARICOM is not all just about work you know we're a big melting pot for a lot of regional public servants from all over the Caribbean and so we would have implemented a lot of activities that would have celebrated the family um, at Easter time, also Caribbean Wellness um, Week, we would have worked very closely, that, that is the staff association, with the HRM program to implement um, our Family Fund Day. Um, one of the big activities for me, it was the International Women's Day celebration. International Women's Day always, I think it occurs on March 8th. And so we had a lot of other activities that celebrated the Father's Father's Day activities and so on. But notwithstanding that, um, I work a long time in the resource mobilization section. And that is the section that dealt with a lot of the regional projects, how we implement them with technical cooperation aid from a lot of our international donor partners. Um, um, donors like the European Union, um, Canada, USAID, IDB, CDB. And so we would develop projects that would be of benefit to more than one Caribbean country. Notwithstanding that, um, I had a stint in another department over a period of time of, like, let's say, about 11 years, where I um, serve as a CARICOM electoral observer. And that was quite an interesting journey. My last stint was um, covering the elections in Bahamas. But I had a very memorable journey when we covered the elections in the British Virgin Islands. The Caribbean community was, in, was invited to cover that elections. 
And when we got there under the leadership of Ambassador Rudy Collins, um, the governor decided that given the size of the population and having two teams on board, because there was another team from Britain, mm -hmm. um, he identified Ambassador Collins to lead that team. And one thing I can tell you, working with Ambassador Collins, you learn from the best. So it was quite an interesting journey. So I've always had an interest in governance issue based on my studies in public administration, good governance, rule of law, electoral processes, and so on. Um, so that is something that I'm also interested in. On the issue of election processes and having observed elections in other Caribbean countries over the years, um, we had our own um, issues with elections um, last year. Um, what, what, if you suppose, if you were to give a brief um, comment on, on what we experienced um, after the March 2nd elections, what would your comment be? I really don't want to say too much on that, but just to say as a Guyanese, I'm very, very proud that Guyana has one of the most robust systems, electoral systems in the Caribbean. And I say that because when you look at the total package in terms of what goes into the printing of the ballots, um, the training of electoral staff, um, how people uh, ought to identify themselves going into the polling station and so on, I think our system um, is very very robust and rigid what happened in terms of what played out in the um in after the elections i would want to leave that to people who are more um who are more authorized to talk about that but i would like to say that the caricom electoral observer mission are very recognized across the region and, uh, and they're well respected. So that is all that I'd probably want to say about that right now. All right, Mrs. Phillips, uh, we'll take a very short commercial break and when we come back, we'll continue to speak with Ms. Magna, Phil Magna Phillips, um, the wife of the Prime Minister of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to Focus. My name is Leroy Smith, if you've just joined us, and we're speaking with Mignon uh, Phillips, the wife of the Prime Minister, and also former Chief of Staff of the Ghana Defence Force. Um, Mrs. Phillips, before we went to the break, we were talking about accomplishments and so on. But what I need to get from you um, is being the wife of, a, first of all, the Chief of Staff, but before that, a senior member within the Ghana Defence Force, an officer in the force. How has that affected your family life, if at all, given the hours and what's not? At home, I was always responsible for keeping things very steady and calm so that my husband was allowed to do his work without um, having to worry about things at home. Serving as the chief of staff and being his wife, it came uh, to me, I would say, a great invasion of your privacy. You're now high profile. I had to be careful what I say. I had to be careful about making new friends. I had to be careful of dealing with some of the friends that I had also, because um, it was um, important that I did not place myself in a position where I could have been misquoted on anything. So it allowed me to step back and really give, um, him all the support that he needed so that he could focus on what he was doing in terms of his service to country. Mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Phillips, what was the day like or the night or the morning when your husband told you he's getting into politics? 
Ah. Oh. Well, I think I was at work when he called to prep me to say that we will have a family discussion about something that he wanted to share with us. You know, at home we have an adult daughter and so we would all have these conversations to whenever it was um, sort of him having to make a very big decision. Prior to that, the last time we had such a conversation was when he was, um, he was one of four officers, I think, that was being interviewed for leadership uh, in the army. And so I said to myself, what, it, what could this conversation be? Mm -hmm. But being a good wife, I got home and at dinner, he brokered the thought that he was thinking of getting involved in politics. Mind you, before that whole conversation, he was really concerned about the, uh, what happened in the country after the no confidence motion. We both studied public administration and so we were both interested in things of good governance and the rule of law. And um, I used to say to him, I said, you know, you were happily retired. And we were doing a number of things. We started to travel a bit. We went to Cuba. We went to Barbados. We went to Trinidad. As a matter of fact, we were preparing to get to um, Panama and the Dominican Republic when all this happened and we had to put all those plans on hold. So we had this conversation and, you know, I said to him, you really sure you want to do this? And he said he felt it was the right thing for him um, to do. Any which way, he was already happily retired and he, the least that could happen that was that he could have probably gone back to being happily retired. <laughs> so there was really nothing for him to lose, you know, getting involved into politics. Um, we were concerned given our political climate and what happens at elections, the personal attacks that we probably would have had to encounter. But I must say he did a good job at preparing us as a family to, um, deal with the public scrutiny again second time around now much more high profile um you know you just had to be calm i had to be careful not to wear certain colors at work <laughs> because of the organization you know every monday i wore my red shoe to work i had to stop wearing my red shoe my red brooch because i didn't want to give anybody a chance of saying that I was campaigning for any political party. As a regional you, public you? servant, we have to stay neutral and I know the spotlight was on me. One of the things that I was very concerned about is as family members, people targeting us. And um, a little bit of that happened that I won't want to discuss because that's behind us now. But I really feel that Guyana, in Guyana, the politics, we need to be much more mature and keep people's wives and children away from being targeted during the political season. Try as much as possible to deal with issues. You know, I'm not on Facebook, but some people would tell me all that's been happening. But my husband um, is a very tough cookie. He's a soldier, well trained. So he knew what he was getting into and my duty was to support him helping to prepare and one of the big things for us was helping him prepare for his very first public speech at the kitty market square and that is a whole story all by itself you know at home we keep saying to him tell us the points let us know what you're saying what is it you want to say and he had all these ideas and you know one morning he woke up at six or seven pages of points and it was how could you, within a short time, say all these things, you know? So there it is, I had to put on my um, administrative cap, pick all the salient points. And you know, one of the things that happened, I kept a scrapbook of all his engagements when he was chief of staff. And I did not remember that he had said, now that he's retiring, he was going to take off his military clothes look for suitable civilian clothes and find a job so that he could continue to serving the people of this country. And as soon as I saw that, 
it was bingo it was good to dovetail into his message and i must say um it made the headlines it yeah. made yeah <laughs> and i must say after his second speech he got so comfortable on the platform he forgot his speaking notes myself and daughter between um us we were saying that was not in his speaking notes what is he saying so we stopped looking a matter of fact just to be on the safe side we used to take photographs near to the tv to show that i was not at the political rallies mm -hmm. i don't want anybody to photoshop me into the rallies because as, as i said the um being a, a regional public servant i had to be careful i i stayed away from the campaign trail but at home he knew that that we loved him dearly and he, he went out there knowing that we supported him a hundred percent are you campaigning today you're wearing a red shoe no it's now <laughs> it's off of campaign season i love to wear i always have a red pair of shoes in my wardrobe and now was a good time for me to wear it trevon are we getting the red shoes i'm getting the red shoes. perfect um mrs phillips you would have um done some work with breast can with, with cancer awareness and what's not and you would have also done some work with the periwinkle club tell us a bit about those two and what else did you really work on um in terms of groupings and giving your, your service yes um i think it was in 2005 2006 i volunteered with the avon community health fund and they wanted the owner of that fund was the franchise owner for the Avon um, products in Guyana. And she wanted to bring the breast cancer message to um, Guyanese women. And so she asked me to lead a team of Avon representatives, most of them are housewives, um, to bring the message of breast cancer education and awareness to Guyana. One of the good things about that was based on the work that I would have done the American Embassy would have um, saw the work that I did and identified me, selected me for a fellowship. So I am an alumna of the International Visitors Leadership Program. And what that program allowed you to do is to, I had a, um, I think it was a three week stint or five weeks since in the USA and we covered how they would have done this whole thing of education and awareness in various types of communities, um, public private partnerships and how they would have rolled out those programs. Um, the group that year that I went in 2011, the group consisted of a number of um, I think about eight to nine persons from across the world on colleges lawyers, breast cancer survivors, advocates, people from all over the world that they would have selected through their embassies um, to benefit from this program. And after the um, Avon Fund ceased operation in Guyana, I think I had moved on just probably a year or two before then, and I started to work with the Periwinkle Club. And that's a cancer club that support mostly women who are affected by breast cancer, cervical cancer. And um, we would give them support, provide music therapy, art therapy. We will help them to gather uh, once a month so that they can share experiences. We provided counseling for them. The club is no longer in the, at the Albert Street location. My recent understanding is that it has moved to North Rumfeld, but the club is really there to really support a lot of um, patients. What has happened recently is that others have gotten involved. So in terms of the financial support to the Periwinkle Club, um, that has been affected somewhat. One of the major donors, um, the Bank of Nova Scotia, I think they have changed their um, policy in terms of the support for that particular area i might not be too accurate in that but um so it's a little difficult now for the volunteers and the sick people to raise a lot of money to help support them but i think 
still think there's a pocket of money and the club continues to be open to so support women who need help with their um, blood tests, some chemotherapy, some radiation therapy, and that type of thing. All right, as we uh, prepare to head on to the home stretch of this interview, um, we remind you that we're speaking with Mrs. Phillips, the wife of the Prime Minister of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Um, Mrs. Phillips, the, are we likely to see um, you've, you've, you've been a virtually private woman, um, but are we likely to see you in a different role now um, that may align with the public responsibilities of your husband? Well, personally, I've committed myself to giving my husband my undivided attention in terms of his work. He's new into politics. Um, he's got quite a lot on his plate in terms of the portfolio. And so, although he leaves home every day very happy to serve the people of Guyana, I still would like to make sure that he has the support he needs when he comes home. Because things can be very stressful and we are, I am his first line of defense to support him and help him de-stress. One of the things that I'm curious and I'm interested in is um, how we treat each other as Guyanese. And I say that because um, one of my um, security officers, um, I've experienced personally, um, she being of Amerindian descent, being targeted by John Public constantly and I always admire the way she handles herself so one day I asked her how do you really cope and she said mom this has been it since I was in school and I feel I need to do something about that we need to start thinking as Guyanese there's no going back to Africa there's no going back to India we we're born and bred here this country belongs to all of us and so I would want to work on something that would really and truly promote the uniqueness of being a Guyanese, regardless. You know, one day someone noticed probably how she was dressed and, and, and she was supporting me um, out there. And this young man was brave enough to come up to her and challenge her. So what do you think you can do trying to, uh, you know, I stayed calm and she just continued working with a smile, really, really professional. So I would just hope that good sense prevail and she would not have um, an opportunity to probably um, um, defend herself, you know, in the line of her duty with somebody who would have been a little too aggressive in approaching her. She's a professional, she needs to do her work. And coming back to what you asked me, I am still to decide on something, but whatever it is, I would hope that um, it would be something that would promote us as being a unique, a unique people. Because, um, you know, we enjoy each other cultural events, we enjoy each other's foods. And I say that because, you know, I did some studies in India, some NGO management training in India. And when we were there, we had a lot of students from all over the world. And a lot of people were complaining about, this, about the food. It was too spicy, a lot of pepper. And I had pleasure in teaching them how to drink the dal, mm -hmm. how to eat the roti, how to use the curries. And after then, you had to be on time for your meals because they just develop a new taste for the food and everybody was comfortable. So that is what I probably want to do. Mrs. Phillips, yourself, your husband, the family, you've moved into a heritage building, um, the official residence of the Prime Minister. 
What are some of the things you would have had to give up, the freedoms and what's not, in order to adjust and be living here? It's an honor and privilege to live at this heritage building. I think it comes with great responsibility to take care of it. And as a family, we would want to leave it in an even better condition than we found it when we got here. So it takes a lot of time to take care of it. One of the things that I miss most is driving myself. I need to feel that pedal under my foot. <laughs> but you know, when they brought me here, my security officer said to me, Mrs. Phillips, this is it for you. You won't be able to leave here unless we come with you. So I've had to learn to surrender my freedom of just being spontaneous and going about um, my own business. We are now in service to the country, so I guess it comes with high office. One of the things that um, they did allow me to do was to go back and say hello to my, the vendors that I normally would buy from in Border Market. I mean, they were so happy to see me and um, to say how proud they are and the whole thing that they know the Prime Minister's wife, I'm their friend and so on. So it's quite a good feeling to know that um, people at that level would want to embrace you and wish you well as we start this journey and continue on our way. How do you feel living in the bubble as it's known? Um, you turn here, there's a security over your shoulder, you turn there. Like, how, how does it really feel? Well, I must say they've allowed me, they've allowed us to be, feel very comfortable. Um, they keep a safe distance. Once something um, they need to inform us about, they would do so very discreetly. And so we we're always well prepared because we have to work hand in hand with each other mm -hmm. so that I won't give them a tough time to protect me. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like breaking up teams and so on, but um, I'm very comfortable right now. All right. So I have two more questions. You worked at CARICOM. Um, our former first lady um, also worked at CARICOM. Did you guys at any point in time had to rub shoulders or so? Yes, we were tell colleagues. Us, tell us about it. We were colleagues, professional colleagues. She, um, we are a big, happy family at CARICOM. We treat uh, each other with respect. We work um, every day. Um, I would have called her Sandra. She would have called me Mignon. At times when we had to say uh, Mrs. Granger, or she would say Miss Bowen, you know. We had a very good working relation. And I don't think that um, our husband political paths crossing would cause us not to be colleagues. We were always colleagues, so there is always mutual respect. Any conversations after she became First Lady? No, I never had the opportunity um, to really have close-up. Um, a few times that she did visit in the office, um, others were very busy getting to... Um, getting a few words with her and so on and then I just was busy getting my work done but um, I think in the very early days we would have said hello and congratulations and supported mm -hmm. each other but since my husband became the prime minister of this country we did not get an opportunity to say hello to each other but I'm sure she would have wished me well okay all right is there anything you'd like to close off with before we we end well, just to say that it was a pleasure talking with you. It, this has been my first um, interview. It's not something that um, I normally do. As I said, we guard our privacy very much. And um, I hope that the, your viewers would have had a very good insight into the Phillips family. This has been Focus. My name is Leo. We spoke today with the wife of the Prime Minister, Mrs. Phillips. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, we'll see you here again next week.